the next few years, he would score political points by adopting a cocky attitude towards the USA, picking fights whenever possible. In January of 1969, Sweden recognizes North Vietnam as the first Western state to do so and abandons South Vietnam. The government also decides it's going to send economic aid to the North, though it would pause until the end of the war at the request of the USA. US diplomats are at this time hard at work attempting to cool down the anti-American rhetoric in Sweden and questions what kind of a neutrality Sweden displays when it's so blatantly pro-communist. The USA is also annoyed by Sweden receiving war deserters and using them for propaganda against the war. American state officials can hardly walk the streets of Stockholm without being attacked. In 1970, Palme is received in the USA during a state visit, and Americans start to think that Palme might have called him down, yet in two years, he would prove them very wrong. In December of 1972, after American bombing of Vietnam had intensified, Palme held a speech comparing this bombing to the Holocaust. Guernica, Orador, Babiar, Katyn, Lidice, Sharpville, Treblinka. Där har våldet triumferat, men efter världens dom har fallit hård över de som burit ansvaret. Nu fogas ett nytt namn till raden. Hanoi, julen 1972. The USA described it as a great outrage that a supposedly friendly country would equate Americans with Nazis. The State Department also found it curious how Sweden, who had had friendly relations with Germany during World War II, calls the USA Nazis. After this, diplomatic relations are frozen for nearly two years. Following his clashes with the USA, he would turn his focus towards domestic policies, implementing disastrous economic policies that would greatly hurt Sweden's economic progress, as well as initiating the mass immigration of asylum seekers to the country, most likely in an attempt to secure election victories. Eventually, Palme's antics would catch up with him, and on the 28th of February 1986, is murdered after walking home with his wife one night, without any bodyguards. Left-wingers instantly believe that it must have been one of Palme's many enemies that must have assassinated him, though it turns out the killer was probably a bum. Christer Pettersson wouldn't be found guilty of the murder, yet on his deathbed he confesses to having done it. One of the great scandals that rocked Swedish society in the 1970s was the Jäger affair. A lesbian woman named Doris Hopp had run a brothel consisting of teenage girls who had been taken into foster care and then forced into prostitution. From 1971 to 1976 she had accepted society's elite as customers and offered them these girls, some as young as 13 years old, who were in the ward of the state. The matter became a national affair when it came to the public attention that Lennart Jäger one of the ministers in the previous Social Democrat government had been a frequent visitor of this brothel. Investigative journalist Peter Bratt had released the story to the public on the 18th of November 1977, writing for Dagens Nyheter. He would, however, suffer extensive attacks on his person for writing this article. Olof Palme, who had been the prime minister of the former government, denied there was anything to this story and accused the newspaper of libel. Recently elected centrist Prime Minister Torbjörn Feldin also claimed the accusations must be false, since he himself was alleged to have visited the brothel and he assumed no one would even consider that he might be guilty as charged. Justitieminister Sven Romanus took del av innehållet i promemorian. I en passus där omtalades att bordellmamman uppgivit namn på kända kunder som hon skulle ha haft. Några exempel angavs. Och jag kunde på rak arm konstatera en direkt lögn. Jag fann nämligen att mitt eget namn var med 
bland de uppgivna kunderna. Two of the victims were Eva Bengtsson and her cousin, both 14 years old at the time. And between the two of them, they had to service at least 70 men among Swedish societal elite. In the trials that were to follow after the police started investigating the errand, brothel manager Hopp was sentenced to two years in prison for procuring, but no clients were sentenced to prison or even fines, in spite of that buying sexual services from 14-year-olds was a punishable offense. In fact, almost all the charges were dropped, allegedly as a consequence of directives from above. When the affair had run its course during the 70s, no justice had been meted out, the child molesters remained in society's elite, in mass media assuring everyone what moral people they were. The 28 girls who had been forced to serve as prostitutes faced a society that didn't believe their stories and that didn't care about them, so many of them took their refuge in drugs. 30 years later, after two people had decided to dig into the story and contact the girls who had been the victims of this affair to write a book about it, the topic was once again brought up for discussion. In the book, the authors describe how the two Swedish prime ministers during the 70s had both been clients at the brothel, Olof Palme and Torbjörn Fellin. The book starts out by covering a proposal for a new sex crimes law which would to a large extent legalize pedophilia, pioneered by Social Democrat Minister of Justice Lennart Geyer. Geyer had worked for removing prison sentences for all but the most major offenses and also for removing all special treatment of homosexuals, a very radical activist whose dismantling of the penal system Sweden still suffers from today. In 2007, Eva Bengtsson filed a damage complaint to the Chancellor of Justice asking for 1 million Swedish crowns or about $100,000 along with an apology from the government. When the complaint was answered, she found she would get neither, however. With the indicated starting point, I have had no reason to attempt to investigate which people were clients of the girls. I have thus concluded that the state should not abstain from invoking limitation. With this assessment I lack reason to go into the matter of which damage has been suffered by Eva Bengtsson or the cousin, as well as into the matter of whether any misconduct has taken place that would constitute a right to compensation for violation. Eva Bengtsson's and her cousin's demands have been limited. It can't be said with certainty that any serious wrongdoings have been committed against her or the cousin. The Chancellor of Justice then has no reason to abstain from invoking limitation. The damage claims will hence be rejected. <coughs> hence, to summarize, no damages, no apology, no further investigation into who the clients were. And this is where Swedish society stands today.